Jones steps up. Ricketts is at the high point. Jones. Aromaterio has a lane. Nicholas Aromaterio, the shot. Scores! Holy jumping! The Italian stallion puts the puck in the back of the net. Mamma mia, Nicholas Aromaterio! So the chief it even does. Callum Jones reports at the blue light kept in by the skate of Thomas Maya. Maya. Down low on the half course, he swings out of the slot for Potts. Kyle Potts has it, hangs on, now he shoots, scores! Holy jumping! How do you do? Kyle Potts puts the puck in the back of the net. Blocked that shot, and coming the other way is Alton McDermott, he's in on the breakaway, scores! Holy jumping! His grandfather, Paul Henderson, must be ecstatic about that one because Alton McDermott just scored his first career Buckland Cup final playoff goal has been pulled. The Dukes are in the Oakville zone. Zone Elvis swung that around. The Blades are trying to tie this puck up. It goes into the corner. The Blades have a chance to get this out. Elvis will tie it up. Ten seconds. Gilmore has it at the point. It's in. Tips just wide. Seven seconds. It's back in the corner. Ewing's blocking. Three, two, one. The Oakville Blades. Oh! You're watching Mamma Mia! This is Fire Talk with Nicholas Fiore. Welcome back, everybody, to episode number 18 of Mamma Mia! This is Fire Talk, and I have a special guest on today's edition of the show, Dominic Hennig, the play-by-play -play broadcaster for the Flint Firebirds and director of broadcasting and communications. Dom, I know you wear a lot of hats, and we're going to get to them. But first of all, thanks for uh, coming on. I appreciate it. They always good to talk hockey, you know, especially uh, without a season right now. These things uh, hit home a bit more. So, you know, enjoy this. Absolutely. And, uh, and we're going to have to enjoy this. I mean, you've done plenty of these in your off season as well with, um, with Flint. You have your own uh, show, network, podcast. You, you do tons of things. You're on the <laughs> NHL Network, Sirius XM sometimes. But let's talk about, you know, your broadcasting in general. You, you obviously started at Ferris State University, um, and then it obviously led you to here. But, you know, let's give a background of, of why you got into broadcasting. Was it a passion from a young age? And obviously what led you to where you are today? For me, I played uh, minor hockey in the uh, Metro Detroit area growing up. Um, really, really loved everything about the sport, the team environment, the people, the parents, the, the quality of, of, of family, and, and just wanted to be involved in hockey uh, my whole life. And, and I, I knew that I wasn't going to make it as a player, or at least, you know, I figured I wasn't going to make it as a player, but I still wanted to be involved in that team environment, um, seeing new cities, new arenas, new places, and, and meeting, you know, just amazing humans. And, and so uh, I started to do some research at a young age, at like 13 or so, and, and was wondering, okay, how do you still, in, you know, involve yourself in that team environment? You know, what's maybe, maybe the best path that you could see yourself being in? And um, it, to me, it, it was broadcasting, you know, whether it be radio or TV, you're still, you know, in most markets, you're still on the team plane, you're still in the team hotel and, um, you know, with, with, you're still watching every shift, every play, every minute. And so, you know, I said, okay, that's, that's what I'm going to go for. So I started at the age of 14 in Santa Fe, New Mexico at the Santa Fe Roadrunners in the North American Hockey League. Uh, now the Topeka Roadrunners, and I think they just moved again. Um, and, and from there, um, 17 years old, I, I called my first NCAA Division One hockey game with Ferris State University. Ironically, uh, at the age of 20, the, the team made it to the Frozen Four in the NCAA National Championship game in Tampa, sold out 18,000 people on ESPN. It was amazing. Um, and then started my master's at Ferris. And then after, um, when I turned 25, the Plymouth Whalers and the OHL moved to Flint. Um, and I, you know, I'm a hockey guy through and through, and, um, I, I try to make that jump to the OHL and did that. And, you know, I've just finished my fifth season in the OHL now. So, um, you know, upwards of 12 years, you know, doing this consecutively now, um, play by play and communications and media for, for a hockey club. 
um, and just truly, truly blessed and thankful to, to, for every door that has opened and, and gave me this opportunity and just working in hockey when I want to be anywhere else. And obviously you've been with Flint since the beginning, um, since they came into the league, the inaugural season. And there was a, f- a few losing seasons, let's be honest, at the beginning. And I know that very well with when I started with the Brampton Bombers, there was a couple losing seasons, but you kept the passion and, and you have the passion clearly. Is it hard though sometimes to call these blowout games and these, and these hard games, but still know that, okay, I love the game. I love what I'm doing. Just got to plug through and keep on going. I think that the latter of what you said there, and I get that question a lot. And, and the way I look at it is, is after being fortunate enough to call the pinnacle of NCAA Division One hockey in the Frozen Four um, in the national championship game, and then calling losing seasons like the Firebirds had, um, I saw both ends of the spectrum. And so what I thought when looking at this big picture is um, at the end of the day, it, it should make you a better broadcaster. Okay, I, I've been to the top. I've experienced that. I don't need to go over the top of my calls now and be a homer and be upset when my team, you know, doesn't get the right call because, you know, you've been there, done that. And I've done the losing season as well, where, you know, at the same time when when you really need a win, you're not being, you know, a biased broadcaster. For me, I feel like, and I hope anybody who ever watches or listens to a Firebirds game um, would, would, would agree. I mean, that's my goal is I think people would, would see that maybe I'm, you know, too unbiased as a broadcaster. I think that's what it did to me because it kind of removed my, um, not passion, passion's the wrong word. It removed my, I guess, biasness. It removed, removed my like care so badly that you would give up the integrity of your call um, to then be a bad broadcaster where now it's just, hey, I call what happens on the ice. The game's played on the ice, black and white. Um, and, and hopefully that made me more of a professional broadcaster, but there might be people watching this saying, no, I disagree. <laughs> so. <laughs> no, that's what, that's what I've been getting to, obviously, with the Oakville Blades now in the OJHL. I mean, you know, in a way you're, you're not by fault, but kind of a homer because it's your team. You're calling for that team. You're also calling for the league, but you're calling for that team. You're employed by that team. So it's like, yeah, you got to be unbiased, but to, to, to a certain extent. Right. And that's where I guess the fine line is, is being a good or one of the better broadcasters. Right. Yeah. At the end of the day for, for me, the Flint Firebirds write my paycheck. So of course I'm going to be happy when the Firebirds win and, you know, I wish the team won when they didn't. Um, But also in the OHL, every game in Flint is also televised live across the province of Ontario on the OHL Action Pack on cable TV. So I'm not just calling for um, Flint on home games. I'm also calling for the province of Ontario. And for example, you know, if the game, if, if the Kitchener Rangers are in Flint, it's televised on channel 20 in Kitchener and channel 440 or whatever across the entire province. So I'm televising for both fan bases and, Sometimes maybe the Rangers have a bigger fan base than ours, or sometimes maybe we have a bigger fan base than other teams. You have to know your, who your audience is as the broadcaster. And uh, for me, you know, obviously trying to climb the ladder, you, you want to make as many people happy as possible. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, you've been on, on TV and radio. You've done, you've done basically quite a bit, a little bit of both. Um, what, where, is, there, is there a favorite TV or radio? Where do you find yourself more comfortable? Well, um, I think for me, I, I almost want to say, you know, TV is probably the ultimate goal because typically when you're on television, there's bigger ratings. And when your face is on TV, uh, you get compensated higher. So obviously if you're in the booth A or booth B, you probably want more ratings and more money, right? And, and if you're side by side in an NHL rink, um, you know, and, and so I think TV is obviously the goal. Sometimes some people might say it might be a bit easier because you don't have to call every second because uh, people are watching the game as to, compared to if they're on the radio and they're listening. You have to ident- you have to paint the picture for every second. So I think TV would be the end game. I think that would be an awesome career. I think, uh, you know, it would be something that, you know, I thank God for. I already do for my position, but um, it's uh, TV would be the better of the two, I think. Dom, you, you do a lot. I thought I did a lot when I started with the Oakville Blades, but guess what? <laughs> I don't do as much as you. I mean, there's a list, game day media notes, in-game live stats, 
media NHL scout suite, off-ice officials, player relations, appearances, press releases, public relations, live game videos, websites, social media, play-by-play. <laughs> and, and, I, and I would imagine play-by-play would be your downtime, would be your relaxing time because all these other things are just as crazy. And, you know, obviously you love it. That's kind of, I guess, the only way you're really doing it. And, and sometimes, you know, I, uh, our good friend Garrett Rutledge told me that you have to sometimes do things that maybe you're not getting, you know, fully compensated for to get your name out there to, to say, okay, who's Dominic Henning, who's Nicholas Fiorian, and then go from there. And obviously you've done a lot of this stuff and you do a lot of this stuff. How the heck do you do it all? <laughs> Simply yeah, like that. Well, well, for me, uh, you know, still being a young age, I don't own a house. I don't have to worry about maintenance, I'm cutting the lawn. I, I have a great fiance now who's very supportive. Congratulations. Um, th- thank you. Yeah. And, and you need that. Um, and, and for me, I'm just able to, and no kids. So I'm able to dedicate 110% of my day to the job. And some people say, you know, call me crazy for, for doing that, working every hour, every minute of the day. But I absolutely love what I do. I mean, I always say to people, imagine telling somebody in Africa or wherever that, you know, you, you work full time for a hockey team health benefits, the whole nine, a full-time salary for a hockey team. People would be like, what are you, what is hockey? And, and for me, I absolutely love that. I feel blessed for that reason. And, and when you ask about the broadcast, I would say the broadcast is probably the smallest part of my job duty right now. Um, and a lot of people might feel like it's about the broadcast or it's about them. But for me, I enjoy serving people. So I enjoy setting up the press box for the visiting, you know, out of town media. I enjoy setting up the media suite for the visiting NHL scouts. I enjoy making things perfect for people and then look after myself last. And that's what it comes down to. The broadcast is kind of last, but that's probably why I'm looking so forward to going to the next level, whether it be the American League or the National League, is because then I can just focus on my broadcast. Then I could just, everything else, there's people in place with bigger budgets to handle everything else. Right now, if I don't do it, it won't get done. And, and I want to work for an organization or a franchise that has the nice press box, the nice media suite, that has nice game notes, it has a good website. And it, since, you know, until I climb that ladder, it, if I don't do it, it won't get done. And so I feel like I've been fortunate enough to try to build the franchise into that light. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, currently my passion is broadcasting and, and you know, that's, uh, that's a, uh, um, that's, that's, you know, that's the most fun part of the job, I would say. And that's the, and that's the end, end game goal in the future. Absolutely. And, you know, you, you talked about the NHL scouts a little bit, how cool is it, you know, dealing with NHL people, whether it's, I don't know, players, scouts, other managerial staff members, coaches, just in general, how, how cool is it? Uh, that, you know, you get the opportunity to uh, deal with these guys in the higher ranks? Well, I guess for me, it's not about, you know, cool that that's their title. It's there's some amazing people out there. I mean, there's people who are away from their wives and kids and just looking to talk and talk hockey. And that's the coolest part is, you know, hey, what'd you see last night? Hey, you were here last night too. What'd you think of that, you know, goal or whatever? And, you know, I just think hearing their stories and and, and trying to be kind of a a hospitality um, outlet for them when they're away from home and on the road the whole time is most important. You know, when they show up, I want to make sure there's a nice meal there for them. I want to make sure they have a reserved seat plate with their name on it. Um, and the Wi-Fi password is there and they have an ethernet plug there and, you know, all, all of that. So when they come in, all they have to do is watch hockey. Um, and, and hopefully that bodes well at the NHL draft because then maybe more people might want to come to Flint instead if they have an option and then see our players and, and move on from there. And, and so, um, you know, when I guess when I look back on hindsight, when you mentioned it, you know, is it cool to, to be working with NHL scouts and NHL GMs? You know, of course, it's the National Hockey League. Anytime you can position yourself at the NHL, it's amazing. But I look further into that. I mean, I don't really get starstruck like that. I look more into them as people and, um, you know, just fun to, fun to just live hockey. That, that's the best way to put it, live hockey. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, with a thing of living hockey, you got to live hockey with relationships and you got to live everything with relationships. It's so, so important. What can you say about the relationships, you know, that you've made and, and how important is it? Yes, in everything in life, 
but in, in our world, in the broadcasting world and within the game of hockey? No, you always hear it. Sometimes it's maybe not as much as, as what you know, but who you know. And, and you could see that in life 10 times over. Every day you see it. And, um, you know, relationships, again, are, are nice. But I look at that kind of as a negative. When I look at relationships or networking, to me, it seems like, you know, you're just using somebody just to climb the ladder. And that's not the case. For, for me, I legit, again, just love to be in hockey. So blessed and fortunate to work in the OHL and NCAA Division One before coming here um, and just realize how quickly you can be replaced. Realize how quickly somebody else can do your job and then you're out of it forever. So for me, it's not necessarily as much about uh, living or, I'm sorry, the relationships or networking. Um, for me, it's more about just being a good person, just trying to do things the right way. And if you get recognized or noticed, fantastic. If not, keep working as hard as you can to climb the ladder and, and hopefully live out your dream one day. Um, what's the difference between the NCAA to the OHL? Maybe touch upon the game in itself, but then also the difference in the two leagues in the broadcasting standards. So uh, the game itself, I would say first things that stand out to me, um, and you always hear this fight of the dark side or the OHL is the better route or college hockey is the better route. Like I said, I've seen the pinnacle now of, of, of NCAA. Uh, I've been to Memorial Cup games. I, I've been to the pinnacle of, you know, the OHL so or the Canadian hockey, major juniors. So, um, you know, I feel like I, I have a good example on both. Uh, I don't think one league is better than the other. It, it's all about, you know, what type of player are you uh, to get to the NHL. So on the ice, I, I guess one of the biggest things that um, I like as a broadcaster and I guess probably as a player is the amount of games. I mean, we have 68 games in the Ontario League. Um, and at NCAA, I think it was 34, or 36 league games, yeah. not including, you know, uh, playoffs and, and into the N national championships. So, uh, or the NCAA tournament. So, um, a number of games is, is nice. B, you know, instead of just Fridays and Saturdays, and I think the big 10 or some leagues are starting to go to weekday games a bit here, but you know, the OHL, it's not uncommon to have a game on a Wednesday, you know, at seven o'clock and then, you know, go and, and come back home and be home by midnight. And then, you know, our kids are expected in class the next day. So, um, that's a huge benefit. Um, you know, I think in terms of preparing yourself for a true pro, you know, NHL or AHL uh, schedule um, in terms of major junior compared uh, to college hockey. Now on the op and then, and then just the OHL look around. I mean, almost every arena is a palace. Every game has great fan bases, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine thousand. 9,000. Every game is on TV um, in the OHL and the travel. It's the best travel in the world for any major league or not major league, but you know, high level league. When you think about it, majority of our games and we're on the outskirt we're, we're the furthest west team i think and and majority of our games are within you know three hours so um and and, and five teams i think within two or an hour and a half so you know when you start talking amount of games schedule um travel uh arenas facilities fan bases um and then television coverage and exposure um, you know, it, it's been, it, it's an awesome league, but then again, you could go look at the big 10 and see Michigan with their band and their student section and, and Western has an amazing student section and, and Notre Dame and North Dakota have palaces as rinks too. And, you know, they have games on, you know, ESPN, U and, and, and the CBS sports network, you know, they have national TV games. Um, you know, it, it's, it's why I, I don't get into the whole, which league is better. It's more so what's right for you that they all have, you know, benefits and perks, um, and as well as negatives. Um, so in terms of, you know, that's kind of the way I look at the two leagues, but when you, uh, when you talk about broadcast, I mean, that's the way I look at it from, I guess, from your point of view and maybe broadcasters watching this, um, I think I would imagine the OHL is the better route because you have more games, so more practice, B, games are on television, um, you know, C, maybe fans are more accustomed in, in Ontario and, and these junior markets to be more radio eccentric. Um, compared to, you know, maybe if you're a college, well, games are on, you know, networks like Fox Sports Detroit and ESPN, and people are more so watching that, and radio might be an afterthought. I don't know um, as much. So, uh, and, and probably harder because, you know, universities normally have, you know, strong alumni to be broadcasters. Um, but I've done it both. Loved my time at Ferris State, won a trigger for the world. Thought it was absolutely an awesome lifestyle. 
love my time here in Flint. Want to trade her for the world. Absolutely awesome lifestyle. Both are great. Both are awesome. Both are respectable. Um, and, and got a lot of time for both. And obviously, you know, we, you know, you have a lot of time for it and we all have a lot of time for hockey, but we've had less time for hockey in the last few months okay. due to COVID-19. <laughs> if that is a segue uh, that I tried to make up there, <laughs> but you know, we, we want to get back and, and we want to get back on the ice and the OHL has announced a February 4th return to play start date proposed. I guess you want to c- clarify that of course. Lisa McLeod, the Ministry of Sports here in Ontario, said, no body checking OHL. It's not happening. Um, I don't know if that's a possibility. So from what you know, and as much as you can say, of course, do you believe the OHL will start on February 4th with an abbreviated season with an 18 playoffs? And what's going on with this whole no body checking thing? Yeah, I mean, hey, your guess is as good as mine on the season. I think so. I think, you know, when we, when you start thinking about it, you're talking about the Ontario Hockey League. This is, you know, not a low-level league. The most amount of players in, at every NHL draft, the most amount of players come from this league. Players in the, in the NHL, it's the most amount of players. 70% came from the CHL, right? So when you start talking about all of that, you have to imagine the magnitude for both the NHL, but also jobs in Ontario, right? Concession workers, maintenance workers, you name it. There's a lot more at stake than, Hey, just, and you know, it's just, you know, junior hockey players playing the hockey game. And so will February 4th happen? I don't know, but I could tell you that Dave branch and the OHL will make the right decision. They have legal teams, they have attorneys, they have people talking every day with both the Canadian and U S government every single day. Um, working on what is the best case scenario to get us to play. And, and it's a high level with high powerful people working at it every single day. So I think that's, I think February 4th will stick. I really do. Um, hopefully COVID cases decline and hopefully that border opens. I mean, those are the two things I'm sure they're looking at every day. As for Lisa McLeod, the minister of health and sport at the Ontario league, or I'm sorry, of Ontario, um, she did say that, no body checking, um, but quickly after Doug Ford, who is the yes. premier of Ontario, I believe, and again, I'm American living in you know, Metro Detroit. You know what you're talking about. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Doug Ford, I yes. believe is her boss and or above her on the, po- on, the, on the ladder and came out that night or the next day and said, there has been no official decision and I want to see check body checking um, in hockey. So again, it goes to show you how powerful or how big the OHL is when you're starting to get, you know, premiers and high up government um, getting involved uh, to make, to try to see this thing through. And that, that does, you know, bode well for, for hopefully everybody in the near future. What do you think though, the main struggle would be um, for just the OHL in general to restart and to have a return to play? Well, I think the biggest thing is, 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 is the financials, right? Because, um, you know, with, you know, the players getting essentially, you know, unlimited sticks, free sticks, free skates, the best gear, the best apparel packages and, and whatnot. Uh, And then of course, in my opinion, the best education packages um, of any level, um, you know, that all adds up. And for your listeners who might not know this, if you play in the OHL, say you play for four years with the team, let's say the Flint Firebirds, while you're going to school or while you're in Flint, you can go to school, any school you want on the Firebirds for free. And then for every year you play in the OHL, you get a year of tuition books and compulsory fees, um, you know, for yourself, for your post OHL career. So if you wanted, and realistically, you're not going to go four years and maybe you get one or two out of it realistically while you're playing. And then you get four more after you could get six years of schooling on an OHL owner. So Whereas, you know, maybe you break your leg and you get your commitment or scholarship pulled, who knows? Uh, I, but, you know, again, six years of college education in an OHL franchise, in your OHL career, well, that means someone's got to pay for that. And that typically comes back on the owners. So if you have a season and you have no fans, that's a lot of scholarship money that these owners have to pay for or, or are choosing to pay for on their own. So when you ask what is the biggest, I guess, issue with coming back, I would say, the financials because a lot of these teams get 3,000, 3,500 up to 9,000 a game. Well, wow. if you're not allowed fans, well, that's a lot of ticket revenue gone now 
um, for these kids' college scholarships and education packages moving forward. So I would say that's the biggest issue. And then after that, of course, the border uh, being open, uh, it would be another one. But apparently, again, if the, if the OHL is working with the Canadian and American government every single day since the summer, you'd have to imagine by February, maybe they could come to an agreement on something um, and the border might not be the issue. And then it just comes down to, will the owners accept all of these college education packages with zero revenue coming in? Because if you don't have fans, your wow. corporate partners might start dropping out too, except the ones on television and radio. So if you don't have fans and you're in nice si or your, your signage in your building, your, your giveaways and, and where you make a lot of your money might start to be pulled too. And so you go from, you know, a few million dollar operating budget a year with very little revenue coming in, it's up to see, you know, is that a good business decision as well? So you never know. The, the OH, I don't think the OHL is going to start without the three American teams traveling to Canada, are they? I was told, and again, you hear things and then they are the complete opposite the next day. But what I was told is the OHL will not – the American teams will not go to a bubble system or in Ontario. There's a few reasons why. Billets. Who's going to build kids that quickly? And then what, you're going to spend hotel nights every night for a full OHL franchise? Um, that's going to be another huge expense. And then also there goes all your corporate partners for a year. You say goodbye to your corporate partners for one full season and your season ticket holders. Um, you know, you're going to play games without them. Well, then they realize they might not want you or need you. So you're going to mess up your corporate partners, your season ticket holders, the expense of where you're going to have all your staff and players live, um, you know, and then building open avail availability too. And I do hear that a lot. People say move to Ontario. Well, I feel like Ontario is, is further behind than the States. And I might lose some of your listeners here, but I, I thought COVID numbers are increasing in Toronto. I thought the GTA is not allowing, you know, the lady uh, McLeod's not allowing checking and your arenas are not open and there's no, you know, fans allowed in Ontario. Whereas in Michigan, body checking's allowed 500 fans in our game, in our rinks right now. Um, I would say, Hey, why don't we set up a bubble for the 17 Canadian teams here in the U S that when you really look at it, but no, I'm, I'm kidding, obviously. But the good news I did here is it is all or nothing. It's not, we're going to leave three U S teams for the year. And, you know, rejoin again in the future. It's, you know, we're one league, 20 teams. Um, and it's one, you know, it's, we're one league moving forward. United. Absolutely. And, that, and that's the key, right? The United and David Branch leading the way, of course, for the OHL um, and everyone being united as one in order to move forward as one. And yeah, we, we have, I think, like around 50 to 100 people max in an arena, in a facility in general, in a rink. Um and no, there's no body checking right now because it's all about the stages and numbers are, are around eight to 900 a day for the last two weeks um, in Ontario though. So, I mean, you can say that's good, but that are bad. And you can look at the percentages and say, it's not so great. But then us Canadians over here are looking at the States and saying, wow, there's parties and, and, and raves in Florida and this and that, and even though it's not Michigan, but it's everywhere. So it's all about, I think with COVID here and the return to play in any league, I think it's the fine line, if that makes any sense. Where is the line and how much do you want to cross it or how much do you want to stay behind it in order to have these restarts? Yeah, I think it just comes down to fan attendance for the ticket revenue. The owners are, you know, hoping to have uh, B, if not corporate, or excuse me, revenue from the government or, you know, uh, not a stimulus, but yeah, maybe a stimulus from the government and, and then, you know, so I think that's 1A and 1B and then, and then 2 is the border. I think those are your, your, the two things that two, three things that the governments are looking at. We hope the OHL is going to come back. We hope every league is going to come back in, um, in full throttle. Just say it doesn't God forbid, knock on wood, the OHL doesn't return. Is there an issue with players maybe going to Europe to, to play and pull like um, uh, Tim Stutzel and, and, and an Austin Matthews and get drafted to the NHL from there? I saw Akil Thomas is there. A few other LA draft picks are there now as well. Is that a possibility? And, and is the OHL worried about that? I don't know if it's a possibility. I don't know what the rules are in terms of if you signed a contract in the OHL and what their release or loan type rules are. Um, I'm not exactly up to date on all of that. 
Um, however, you know, I think, of course, players and agents, agents are going to get their players to play the game as much as possible. Think about players like Brennan Othman, second overall pick in the OHL draft. This is his NHL draft year right now and hasn't played a game and might not until February, right? So, um, I, of course, I, I think there, there are possibilities. Um, the, the other thing to think about, I don't know what the rules are with guys that are signed in the OHL, but then prospects players that are drafted that um, uh, have not signed contracts yet. And then also maybe then going to the OJHL route with the USHL route and then college hockey. So all of that I'm sure is in, you know, the minds of, of the executive committee and, and, and the commissioner of David branch. Um, but I also think that, you know, they're quality people that won't just pull or uh, make a decision to start or pull a plug or yeah, start a season because, oh, we might lose guys to another league. I think they're going to do whatever they kind of do it right and do it for the safety of the players, the staff, um, and then, you know, the fan base and the community um, as well. So who knows what there is to bring, but I'd have to imagine February 4th we bring positive news and we'll drop the puck. I just hope that we can continue to play into the, you know, full season from there. Let's hope you, uh, you, you know, the OHL does get going again, but in the meantime, You've been doing some stuff during COVID with the with the players, with the team. Um, touch upon what you've been doing. You, you created a new show as well. Uh, just you know, touch upon what have you been doing technically while being off. Well, yeah, I've uh, you know I've been one of those casualties of of the people in the sports world for um, you know since COVID hit. I've been furloughed since April. For those that don't know what that means, it means laid off. Um, but um, you know, with the with the um, agreement or the idea of being brought back right when the season starts. Um, so it's not permanent. Um, since April, that's a long time. Um, but at the same time, we just went from having a couple bad years to the most successful year in franchise history, 40 wins on a 63 game season in the Ontario league, a 15 game winning streak, 12 straight on the road. Um, and, and we're really playing well. Our attendance was going to be at a record year as well. If we finished out the season is what we projected. I mean, so many positives. Um, and then boom, the, pull, the plug was pulled from us. And so what I wanted to do as, as the teams, you know, I've been here since day one. I'm one of the very few employees still re remaining from the first year. Um, and uh, I didn't want to see the franchise after having such a great year and after putting so much time and effort into it go black. So um, I've chose to continue to work for the team. Um, I've continued to do social media content for the team, keep the website updated, you know, our player signings, um, our trades, our, our acquisitions, all of that to try to stay as relevant and professional as possible to keep the team in the best light possible. So if when we come back, um, you know, things are, are smooth and, um, you know, that's a, a positive. I think it's been one of the best off seasons too in franchise history and, and, you know, quite frankly, um, I wasn't employed during it, but I still kept us going in terms of, you know, we had an OHL draft. We then signed four of our top five players in the first month in May. We were the only team to be at that uh, level, I believe, or one of two teams in, in the whole league. Um, you know, we've signed two, we signed our Europeans. We have our maximum allowed of two Europeans signed. We've traded for two players. So we're at nine guys that have brand new been acquired, I guess, or signed into a Flint Firebirds uniform um, since the end of the season. Um, and, you know, with that, obviously, um, you know, comes a lot of needs from, from these families and players. Our first rounder, it's our first first round pick that's born in Michigan. Um, this year. We went down and, and filmed an all access, mic'd up on him, made sure he had all the Firebirds gear, head to toe, sticks, skates, gloves, everything. Um, you know, all of that takes time and effort and just wanted to keep the Firebirds relevant. And so you yeah, asked what I've been doing. Really, I've just, I've continued to be working, but without getting paid for it. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's, that's just reality in all of sports. I mean, there's a lot of people I know in the NHL who have been laid off. There's a lot of people I know in the American League who have been laid off. There's a lot of people without jobs. It's not just an OHL or a Flint Firebirds thing. It's the reality. The thing is, is we are so lucky to work in hockey and work at this level that, um, you know, I feel like I'm at least fortunate enough to know that when it comes back, 
you're back working for your dream job. Um, and I don't want to have anything stand in the way of that. So that's why I continue to, to, to work and, and, and keep the Firebirds going. Uh, man, let me tell you, pe people must tell you a lot, Dom, you're the best, man. <laughs> because let me tell you, that's, I know, I know you're humble about it too, but man, not, not many people in any job would continue to work without obviously getting compensated for it, but it's the passion and it's the love. And Hey man, I, since I've met you, I, I knew that's the way you were. And I wanted, I want to, you know, kind of look up to you in that way and say, like, I just want to keep on going, even when that's not the case and where, and I want to be where you are one day and obviously move forward and forward. So that, that, that's amazing to hear. I know you're humble about it, of course. Um, but that's, that's good stuff. Thanks man. It means a lot. Absolutely. Um, but there's also more things going on with Flint had some rink upgrades, um, that I've heard about uh, that ha happened through this, uh, long prolonged off season. Um, I heard, you know, obviously Flint, the, the arena there, it's a palace. Well, one it's second here. Let me, let me cut you off because I don't know if any of that is, pu is public knowledge. Okay. Um, there you go. So just before you say anything going you forward, go. yes, the, the Firebirds are the owner, Rolf Nielsen is making great investments into the arena. Fans are, are definitely going to be uh, wild when they come back. But uh, as to what those are, I can't go any further. <laughs> there you go. All, all you, all you got to know is, it's a heck of an arena to, to, to play in, to visit, to see. Hopefully one day I can make my way down there yeah. and Flint to check it out. That'd be fantastic, obviously, uh, post-COVID. But just know it's a good place to be at. <laughs> Moving forward, um, let's, you know, I heard, I heard you're a big wedge salad guy. What's going on there? Is that true or what? <laughs> I have to throw that in there. Come on. <laughs> I do like wedge salad. Um, I actually, the story behind this is, is um, David Branch, the commissioner of the OHL was in Flint one day. Um, and there was a, a steakhouse here in town that we went to dinner after uh, one of our games and he ordered a wedge salad. And I, and I looked at that and I was like, that looks kind of different. I've never seen a salad look like that before. So I got one too that night and unbelievable. I loved it. And so, yeah, ever since then, uh, I do, <laughs> I, I, I do enjoy a, a wedge salad, you know, here and there uh, at a restaurant. That's amazing. Dominic Henning, a wedge salad guy. I, I wouldn't put you for a wedge salad guy. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> That's amazing. Finally here, let's, you know, I, I want to be where you are and, and we all want to move up as well. Yourself and, and me. And this has been my passion and my dream literally since day one, since I was a kid, I never changed my mind. And people say I'm one of the lucky ones that hasn't changed your mind throughout. Um, and obviously I'm doing what I'm doing here. I never thought I'd even be, you know, talking to a few former NHLers, which I have yeah. never thought I'd, you know, even meet you and, and, and obviously come visit you um, and the Flynn Firebirds in Buffalo a couple seasons ago, preseason where I was on a call with you with a uh, 103.1 FM um, yeah. in the States there, WQ US. And, you know, I was so humble and honored to have that experience um, against Hamilton in the preseason, but for yeah. me and for everyone else, what is the key? you think personally in being a good play-by-play -play broadcaster? Play-by-play. -play. Oh, geez. Um, in what yeah, we, we do. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say in our, in our career, you know, commu communications or media guy, I would say just be selfless. It's not yes. about us. It, it's about, you know, the players, the staff, the people around you, the, the NHL scouts, uh, general managers, whomever, just be a good tool, be a good person, whatever anybody needs, the answer is always yes. It's never no. Um, and, you know, just try to be as helpful as possible because there's a lot of care. There's a lot of people who are away from their wives, away from their homes in different countries. Um, and, and, you know, they need help. They need someone to, to count on and just be as accountable as possible uh, to just, you know, if you just want to make people happy and serve people, that's at least the men men mentality and mindset I'm going with. You know, hopefully it helps you in the future. Um, as far as being a broadcaster, I think there's that fine line of, 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 of being a homer and, and, and being too ridiculous, you know, and just try to be as neutral as possible. But of course, you know, a little higher celebration on your own calls and your own goals and compared to the other. And for me, I listen to a lot of NHL games and I don't listen to the games to see who scores or to see, you know, what record was broken. I listen to the pregame shows. How long is that minute? How long was that break? Was it two minutes, three minutes? What was the bumper like, you know, on the intro on the opposite side? Did they say, you know, back for the pregame show? Was it sponsored? Okay, how can I 
put that into a sponsorship here at this level. Um, you know, I record the NHL games um, and then go back and cut the things that I like and then try to replicate that in my own broadcast because if I'm replicating the National Hockey League at the OHL level, well, hopefully that bodes well if we move in future or moving up the ladder um, in the future. But, you know, if, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Obviously, you want to be your own broadcaster. You want to be your own self. You don't want to copy anybody. But, you know, there, there is a blueprint. There is a way of learning professionalism and a, you know, a cadence and a tempo. And, you know, that's the way I look at it. But, you know, Nick, you might be asking the wrong guy. There might be a lot of people who disagree with my broadcast style and think I'm awful. Uh, but at the same time, that's what I do. And, and hope, you know, that's what I believe in. And hopefully it works out one day. You can't please everybody, Dom, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Listen, um, since we knew you, like I said, a couple of years ago, I appreciate you were great with me. Um, that experience in Buffalo with uh, the OHL Flint Firebirds at the preseason game versus Hamilton was fantastic, was amazing. Um, obviously, I want to get to where you are one day and then obviously move on and move on and move on. But, you know, patience is a virtue, I guess. Keep on working at your craft, as people tell me. But I appreciate you coming on, uh, taking your time. Um, congratulations as well on just getting engaged. Thanks. Um, hopefully, hopefully that is very uh, bright, bright future there as well. And I know it will be. And obviously your broadcasting uh, will be continue to be a bright future. And hopefully we get back to playing. But I appreciate you coming on. It means a lot. Thanks, Fire. You'll be here one day, man. You just keep working at it. Thank you. And, and that, that is the plan. And that's what I got to keep on going. Everyone. That was Dominic Hennig, the play-by-play -play broadcaster and the director of broadcasting and communications for the Flint Firebirds in the OHL. This was episode number 18 of Mamma Mia! This is Fire Talk. I'm Nicholas Fiore, the broadcast voice of the Oakville Blades. Instagram lives every week. Follow us on social media, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And the next episode, 19, will be another OHLer. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Stay safe. We appreciate your support. Mamma Mia! Now Davis takes it and looks to come the other way. Davis is in, trying to drive, and he will look to go across. Good play to Davis, though, to get it right back to him. He goes down low to Israel's. Centering, it's there! Scores! Stevie, Stevie, Stevie! Steven Weddle scores his first OJHL playoff goal for the Oak Bell Blades. This game is opening up in a big way for both teams. Ricketts, centering, what a pass, Israel's breakaway, the move, scores! What a goal for the Alaska Fairbanks commit, the assistant captain, Harrison Israel's, with an absolute dandy. Download Alliance, Jack Lyons, centering, scores! The double jacks combine as the, that puck popped up like a jack in a box, and it's Jack Ricketts from Jack Lyons. 6-1 on the 40th shot of the game. It's all over. Well, like Smith hits it in. A chance here can develop, but the Blades will look to take it. And is and Ricketts finds Israels. Breakaway Israels. A chance backhand. Rebound. Scores! And the Oakville Blades win it here in Toronto. Blades win. Blades win. Win. That was Mamma Mia! This is Fire Talk with Nicholas Fiore. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for the next episode.